Good evening, and welcome to our last special midweek Lenten service. We are privileged to have as our guest preacher this evening, Pastor Stephen Sauer from Messiah Lutheran Church in Bellevue. Everything that you will need for the service is on the screen, or the general order is printed in your worship folder. Come, let us worship the Lord. We read responsively. As the people of God, we gather this evening in his name. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. Please stand. Lord, we now ask for your mercy and forgiveness as we sing, and the organist will play the entire melody before we sing. Our God, who is rich in mercy, sent Jesus to pay our debt of sin, to wash us clean in his blood, and to declare us not guilty. In Christ, all your sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the victory over Satan, sin, and death, and making us your own redeemed people. Amen. Please be seated. We now read responsively verses about the suffering and death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus stood before Pilate, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say. Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. 
The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Once more Pilate came out and said to the people, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. As soon as the chief priests and the teachers and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify him. Crucify him. But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. But the people insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. He asked Jesus, where do you come from? Lord Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the people kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now, it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas. Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that Instead, an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate released Barabbas to them, but he took Jesus and had him flogged. Then they led him away to crucify him. Here ends our reading of the passion history of our Savior's suffering and death. Look, the Lamb of God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our study this evening is taken from the Gospel of Luke, 
the 23rd chapter, where I'll read verses 35 through 43. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. These are the words of our Lord. My dear friends who have gathered here in God's house, it is always a joy and a privilege to be able to study God's word with you. I'm glad to be here once again. I wasn't expecting that. Those are words that maybe you've said at one time or another over your life. A few years ago, my wife and I were looking at houses before we purchased one, and there was one house that looked absolutely stunning on the outside, fantastic curb appeal. And we walked in through the front door, looked around and said, this place is a dump. I wasn't expecting that. Other houses, they looked kind of plain on the outside, but as you walked in, it felt like you were right at home. And again, we turned to each other and said, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Have you had one of those moments in your life? Maybe not as you were looking for a house, but maybe it was on your family vacation. You're traveling towards the beach, and it's still a couple of hours, and you thought, boy, I think it's about time to stop and have lunch because you're just starving, and the kids are crying, and your wife says, come on, time to stop and get something to eat. So you pull out your smartphone, look at Google Maps, and look for a restaurant, and the nearest one, in fact, the only one within 30 miles is Al's All-You-Can-Eat Emporium. So you, you pull up to Al's All-You-Can-Eat Emporium, and you notice that the porch is kind of sagging, and, and the roof looks like an old horse with a bowed back. And there's a shutter off to the left, and it's hanging by just one bolt. It's got an old screen door with a couple of rips in it that are repaired with duct tape. And you, you're thinking to yourself, oh boy. You sit down and you have dinner, and when you come out, you look at your wife and you say, I wasn't expecting that. That was the best fried chicken. That was the best apple cobbler. Oh, that was the best sweet corn that I've had in years. I wasn't expecting that. Those I wasn't expecting that moments we also find in the life of Jesus Christ. And when you think about it, Think back to when he was born, maybe a, a, about a year, maybe two years after he was born. The wise men, they came from the east, and they came looking for the king. They went to Jerusalem, didn't find him there. They found him in this small, maybe a, a backwater town called Bethlehem. And after they gave their gifts to Jesus, I wonder if they turned to one another and said, I wasn't expecting that. Or the disciples when Jesus told them, I want you to feed the 5,000 men that are before me and all the women and children too. And they said, all we've got is what this little boy bought, brought as a picnic, picnic lunch. Just a couple of fish and some, some bread. Jesus says, go ahead, feed it to them. So they, Jesus broke it and gave it to them. They distributed it. And after everyone had eaten, they brought together 12 basketfuls of leftovers. I wonder if the disciples looked at each other and said, well, I wasn't expecting that. This evening we're gathered at the foot of the cross and we're taking another look at Jesus' suffering and his death. And as we see him, we're going to take a picture of him as he's hanging on the cross. There's a couple of things that we may not expect. The first thing that we may not expect is that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords our God is hanging on a cross. And the other thing that we might not expect is that he immediately and almost without question extends to the thief on the cross 
the key to the kingdom of heaven without him doing a thing except believing in him. And we might say, boy, I, I really wasn't expecting that, but it's a surprise. It's a wonderful surprise. Now, there is one thing as we study the word of God this evening, as we listen to the, the gospel account and as we read through uh, the scripture readings that you had before that we did expect, and that is mockery. Jesus' enemies, we expect them to mock Jesus, and they did not disappoint us. Pilate, let's start from the top. Did Pilate mock Jesus? Oh, yeah. Put that little sign up on top of the cross, the king of the Jews. Did he do that because he believed it? Absolutely not. He was tweaking the noses of the leaders of the Jews, and he didn't believe that either. In fact, when Jesus said, all those on the side of truth listen to me, what did Pilate then say? <laughs> What is truth? Mockery. The chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law also mocked Jesus. They said he claimed to be the son of God. They ignored all of the things that Jesus has, had done. Healing people, casting out demons, raising people from the dead. And they said he is not God. He's a blasphemer and we should crucify him. Crucify your king? Crucify the son of God? Yep, he's not Christ. Mocking him. Well, even the soldiers got in the act. The soldiers put a robe around him after they had beaten him, put a thorn of crowns upon his head, and then smashed that crown of thorns down so it dug into his head, and then said, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him. It didn't even stop when Jesus was hanging on the cross, did it? The soldiers were mocking him as he hung there dying. The leaders of the Jews came by and they mocked him as well, mocking our Savior, ignoring that he is God. That's something that we expect from sinful human beings, especially since they are unbelievers. And we can, we can understand that. Because as Christians, aren't there times when people have mocked us for our faith? Haven't there been times when they have made fun of us for what we profess, that we believe that Jesus suffered, died, and then rose again, and they say, oh, come on. Have you been living under a rock these last couple of years? Don't you know that life is more than what the Bible says? You know, they'll, they'll mock us in that way. And yet we look at our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we know that he is a king. He is the one who created this world. He is the one who has redeemed this world. He is the one who is in charge even to this very day and knows every instance of our lives and loves us in spite of the many sins that we have committed. Now, if you are new to Christianity, okay, let's say that, that you just found out about Jesus. You just found out that he is God. You just found out that he came to this world as a baby to do something, and then you read the gospel the account of Jesus' suffering and death for the very first time, what would you think? Hey, that's not how you treat a king. Kings aren't supposed to be railroaded to death by some governor. Kings aren't supposed to be abused by some soldiers in a platoon. Kings aren't even supposed to be insulted by a common criminal. Can you imagine being insulted by the scum of society? And that's what Jesus was enduring. In fact, you might come to the conclusion, you know, if I was there, I would have told Pilate to just be quiet, that he didn't know what he was talking about. If I was there, I would have told those soldiers, cut it out, start being nice to this guy. He hasn't done anything wrong. I would have told anybody that this is our Savior. But would you? Maybe instead of asking that question, we should ask the question, why was Jesus there in the first place? And the reason that Jesus was on that cross in the first place is because of our sins. The times that we have mocked Jesus in our lives. And you might say, well, I, I have never mocked Jesus. I never made fun of him. Maybe so. But have there been times when you've mocked him by remaining silent 
when your coworkers or your classmates made fun of Christianity? Have you mocked Jesus? Those times when you perhaps have fallen into sin and then said to yourself, oh, we're only human, what can you expect, Lord? Whereas you're reading the word of God and you come across some commands of God that your sinful human nature doesn't like, do you feel yourself sometimes bristling and saying, Lord, you can't expect me to do that, can you? That's mocking. Have there been times when your life has not been a light on a hill or it hasn't been as salty as God commands us to be? You know, there was a, a young gentleman who went away to college for the very first time. And when he came home, his dad asked him, well, how's it going, son? He says, it's going really good. And his dad asked him, well, are you able to live your faith? And he said, dad, no one can tell that I'm even a Christian. He had hidden his light under a bushel. He was mocking Jesus by not standing up for him. Mockery. Uh, we see it very clearly in our own lives. And this evening, we repent of those sins. We ask our Lord to forgive us those sins of action and inaction. Forgive us those sins, that, those thoughts that race through our head that our mothers would be ashamed that we had. Forgive us, dear Lord, for mocking you. Forgive us for all of our sins. Mockery. And yet, here's something that you wouldn't expect. In the midst of all of this mockery, we hear a clear confession of faith from a criminal. Now, that's something that we really don't expect. This criminal was, if there is such a thing as hell on earth, this guy was living it. I can almost imagine as he was growing up and as he got to adulthood, somehow, some way, he went down the wrong path. And he had been in trouble probably with the law for a long time. Finally, he spent some time in a Roman prison, and I know that that was not a nice place to be. I mean, it's not the Ramada. It's not the Hilton. It's a cesspool. Finally, he was condemned to death, and he heard the words from the judge, I condemn you to death by crucifixion, and he knew about crucifixion. He had seen it, I'm sure, in his life, and he knew it was going to be painful. As he's hanging there on that cross, with the nails through his hands and his feet, slowly suffocating to death, he must have thought in the back of his mind, there's something worse than this. And all of a sudden, something we didn't expect, he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Where'd that come from? Would, would you expect that? Here's a guy that he's dying and he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me. Somehow the Holy Spirit had given this man a saving faith. It was a small faith. He probably didn't know all of the ins and outs of Christianity like, like you and I do, but he knew that Jesus was someone special. He knew that Jesus was God. Where did he hear that? Well, I think he probably heard the law of God because he said, we're getting what we justly deserve. He heard the law of God, maybe, maybe, I'm speculating here, maybe when he was growing up, maybe he was raised in a Jewish household where, where he learned about God's law. And maybe, maybe, as he was in prison, or maybe when he was out of prison, he might have heard about Jesus, you know, just sort of gossip floating around the neighborhood. Maybe he heard Jesus when he said to the, uh, to the soldiers, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because that other criminal was right there getting his hands nailed to the cross too. Or maybe, again, I'm just speculating, Maybe he heard the women at the foot of the cross talk about Jesus' life, talk about his teachings. Whatever the case is, I don't know how the Holy Spirit accomplished it, but he did. Somehow the Holy Spirit, through the gospel, through the good news, through the news about Jesus Christ, created a saving faith in this man's heart. And it was that saving faith that caused him to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And can you imagine? Can you imagine 
the surprise, the relief in that criminal's heart when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. I wonder if the criminal said to himself, I wasn't expecting that. Because Jesus just handed him the key to the kingdom of heaven. The key is forgiveness. The key is Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. That's the key for all of us. Now, I wonder sometimes if we appreciate this gift that God has given to us. You know, we go through life, and maybe we're a lifelong Lutheran. Maybe we've only been a Christian for, for a couple of months or, or maybe a year or two. And, and we understand that this is new. Or maybe we've come to realize this is something we've always known, something we've always expected. But there will come a time in all of our lives when we will be overjoyed to hear, today you will be with me in paradise. Remember me, Lord. Remember me, Lord, when life is tough. Remember me, Lord, when those near and dear to me pound nails into my heart with the harsh words that they express. Remember me, Lord, when I've been sick for so long I can't even remember what it was like to be healthy. Remember me, Lord, when tears are coursing down my cheeks at the funeral home of my husband or my wife or my son, my daughter. Remember me, Lord, when the guilt over my sin threatens to overwhelm me. Remember me, Lord, in my distress. And Jesus says, I do. I remember you. I've known you from before you were born. In fact, I've known you before the creation of this world. I chose you. Before I created this world, I chose you to be my own and live under me in my kingdom where you will enjoy eternal life, eternal joy, eternal happiness. There are times in life, aren't there, when we get what we don't deserve? We call that grace. There are times in our lives when we get what we don't expect, and we call that God's love. This evening, as you've gathered in God's house, remember what he has given to you. We say to our Lord, remember me, and he does. And he has given us all the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's given us his life. He's paid for our sins. He has said, today you will be with me in paradise. If this is your last day, you will be with him in paradise on your last day whether it be next week or whether it be 50 years from now, those words are meant for you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. And now we gather our offerings as a reason to him. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my own.
we pray responsively. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your one and only Son to rescue us from our spiritual bondage. When we get caught up in our lives of work, school, bills, and responsibilities, turn our thoughts and hearts to you. You exchange the punishment we deserve for the crown of eternal life you won for us. So change our lives to live for you and others. Savior, you hold the key to our new home in heaven. When the days of this lifetime become tedious or tiring, help us find strength in your promise that you are with us always. Help, help us, us to look beyond our daily troubles and challenges and see our future, future home with you. Come for us on your cross and guarantee to us in your empty tomb. We ask all these things, Father, knowing that you hear us. Please stand. We ask God to go with us, not only this evening, but every day. Almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Guide us when we are awake, O Lord, and guard us as we sleep, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in his peace. Amen. May the power of God the Father protect you. May the love of God the Son fill you. May the peace of God the Spirit go with you. Please remain standing. Please be seated. Turned it off too soon. We certainly thank all of you for being here for our last special midweek Lenten service. We encourage you to remember, of course, Palm Sunday is this Sunday, and then special Holy Week services on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then, of course, Easter, a week from Sunday. Please note the special services. Thank you for being here, all of you. And a special thank you to our guest preacher. We appreciate Pastor Stephen Sauer being with us tonight, his very encouraging and uplifting message about our Savior's love and help in our life. Thank you very much, Pastor Sauer. Then may the Lord be with us all until we meet again. <laughs>